Hi, I'm Sarah Kavanaugh, and this is Peaceful Exit. Every episode, we explore death, dying, and grief through stories by authors familiar with the topic. Writers are our translators. They take what is inexpressible, impossible to explain, and they translate it into words on a page. My guest today is Dacher Keltner. He is the founding director of the Greater Good Science Center and a professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley. He is one of the world's leading scientists who studies emotion. He's published over 200 scientific publications and six books. He has also written for many popular outlets like the New York Times and Slate and was the scientific advisor behind Pixar's movie Inside Out. Today, we're talking about his book, Awe the new science of everyday wonder, and how it can transform your life. And because this is Peaceful Exit, we will talk about the loss of Dacker's brother to cancer and how awe plays a role in his relationship now to death. Hey, Sarah. How you doing? Great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. I love the fact that your book makes such a complicated subject so digestible and readable. And that's such a gift in your writing. Oh, thank you. What is your definition of awe as you understand it? I define awe as the emotion you feel when you encounter vast mysteries that you don't understand. The things that make us feel awe or what you might call the sublime are vast in terms of their size. You're near a redwood tree. They're vast in terms of time. You know, you can think about the origin of the universe and be awestruck. They're vast semantically, right? Like you think about a big idea, like, oh my God, you know, we're we're all evolving out of these incredibly complex adaptations. So vastness is key. And then, and there are counter examples, you know, really small things can make us feel that awe. Um, And then mystery, I think, is you are perceiving something And you can't quite make it out. You know, you can't quite make sense of it. So the emotion we feel when we encounter vast mysteries. So how would you just make a distinction between awe and fear and horror? Yeah, you know, when we use words, we trick ourselves into believing that the phenomena that they refer to are really distinct and discrete, Mm. but they're not. You know, the emotions are always mixing. And so horror is really about death and destruction, the horrors of war, the horrors of the genocide. And and horror often is vast, right? You look at the vast piles of bodies at the Rwandan genocide and you're just horrified and awestruck. And it's mysterious, which is you you can't imagine what human activity would ever produce that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then fear is intertwined with awe at the level of our definitions with words. You know, awe is often defined as dread and fear. Fear is about peril and threat. And we find in 15 years of research, about a quarter of awe experiences have some fear in it, so significant levels of fear, but three quarters of awe experiences are really free of fear and horror and terror and have this much more uplifting, euphoric, expansive, exploratory quality to it um, that really differentiates awe from fear. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the flavors of awe? And I felt like this was really insightful in terms of sometimes death is horrifying and sometimes it's awe-inspiring. Yeah, the the flavors of awe, you know, and again, this, this speaks to how we approach emotions like awe, which are complicated, is there are many varieties of anger. There are varieties of fear. There, you know, neurologically, we know there are at least four or five different kinds of fear. There are varieties of joy, etc. And so, John Haidt and I, when we were writing about awe, said, you know, awe at its core is about encountering vast mysteries that you don't can't make sense of with your current knowledge. But there are variations in that experience. So, one of them is is there threat involved? Right. And that starts to introduce fear and peril and shifts the physiology of awe, our research shows. Another variety of awe is do you have supernatural ideation that you use to explain it? Like ideas about karma and the afterlife and supernatural figures. Like a lot of cultures have supernatural forces that they invoke to explain things. That will change the the feeling of awe. And to your question, that suddenly transforms 
the wonders and mysteries of watching people pass away. You know, if you really believe strongly in a hell and the threats of that, it's going to make that experience more fearful. Mm -hmm. If you have the belief that you're reincarnated, maybe it'll make it less fearful and more oceanic. So those existential themes make their way into the experience of awe that transforms our feelings about the mysteries of the end of life. So how does wonder fit into this? I know you mentioned that awe was not widely used until the 1990s, but... Right. So are those interchangeable or how do you see wonder and awe? When you have an experience of awe, it's this complicated unfolding of states of mind. And I think people interchangeably use words wonder and awe and astonishment, uh, but you can pull them apart scientifically and conceptually and wonder in the philosophical literature and, and in it increasingly in psychological science is the mental state that follows an experience of awe where you are curious and you engage in cognitive activities that help you understand what you just saw or witnessed, right? Mm -hmm. So my favorite example that I write about in the book, and there's a wonderful book on this, is uh, Newton and Descartes, great thinkers, were awestruck by rainbows. They're just like, and you know, you see a lot of rainbows, you're like, what? How, what is that? I'm awestruck. And out of that awe, you start to wonder like, well, what would produce that? You know, I know it's kind of related to cloudy days or after rain, and maybe it has to do with the light from the sun. So how does that work? And Descartes and Newton did some of their best math and science and physics and color theory out of the awe for rainbows and the wonder that that led to, to figure it out, you know? And so, so wonder is this epistemological state that follows all mm. that really is, you know, you think of it colloquially, it's like, I feel curious. I'm entertaining ideas. I'm in my, the realm of the imagination. So how do you, how do you infuse your daily life with awe? You know, writing awe and studying it for 15 years, you know, and then, um, and then in particular, um, you know, I wrote this book, Having Lost My Brother, who was my source of awe, and, and I had to rediscover awe. And, you know, there was one finding that really shook me, which is everyday awe, that people in different parts of the world feel awe two to three times a week. And that tells us it's easy to access. And so knowing that, what I, what I did, I discovered everyday awe, you know, that if you pause for a moment, take a deep breath and put away names and categories and expectations and kind of think about the vastness of things and the smallness of things and the origin of things. You know, you can be awestruck by the, the light in the sky, which I look at every day, clouds. I stand near trees. I take a moment to make eye contact with other people, just the remarkable quality of eye contact, how it links two minds and the physiological processes um, think about ideas and people who've inspired me morally, you know, that, that their character and sacrifice. So listen to music, you know, just take a moment, take three minutes and listen to a song that brings you goosebumps, you know, and why is that? And ask yourself. So I think a lot of people initially thought in the scientific field of emotion that like, oh, you can't study awe. You know, that's when you go to the mountaintop and have the spiritual epiphany. But in fact, it's all around us. It is. It is all around us. Who's a person of moral beauty that is a moral compass for you? My brother was and is. Uh, he and I had this unusual childhood and we spent a lot of time together. We're kind of raised in the wild, if you will, of Laurel Canyon and the foothills of the Sierras where it was pretty wild time, you know, and we had counterculture parents. But the thing, you know, I actually think temperamentally I was a pretty uptight, anxious greedy, narrow-minded human. And just watching my brother as a kid, he always stood up to bullies. Didn't matter if they were bigger than him. He just always did. He broke up fights. He always made sure that the least privileged person, the mo you know, the person who really was on the outs of this group was always included. He was really wild and courageous. You know, I remember we used to go to the Yuba River in our teens, and it's this really wild river. And, and it kills people every year because it's just wild rapids. And we used to jump into these, off these high rocks into the pools. And he would just like get up, look at it and jump. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And I was like, wait a minute, don't we have to measure this? And how do deep calculation. is it? Yeah. I don't know. Can you chat, test that again? <laughs> and he just jumped. And I was like, well, that's how you do it. You know? So he, he was um, my moral compass very deeply. So as siblings often are. Yeah. And then just recovering that after his loss was really key to me. Well, you were really able to be present with him when he was dying, yeah. which is not something everyone can do. Because I think this culture so removed death from life, but we're working on pulling that back together again. Um, how did you know what to do? So he, my brother passed away because of colon cancer. Uh, and it was about two years of real dramatic, you know, near death experiences, ER visits. And then he passed away. And I'd say for the first 18 months, I was really trying to over control it, trying to make sense of it with science. I mean, anybody who's been really close to a really hard cancer knows like this thing, this is way stronger than science. And my brother had a, a sense that he was passing earlier than the rest of us. And then how I, I really learned to really open to the mystery and awe of this was, frankly, in reading Joan Halifax's book, Being with Dying. Mm -hmm. And she said, like, in the book, let the person who is passing guide you and then focus on being there kindly and be open to mystery. Mm -hmm. And the minute I absorbed that, it changed everything. And I would go visit my brother every week or two and just sit there and be open to where he wanted to take the conversations, what he really thought about the end of life. And it just transformed everything, thankfully, because uh, it's incomprehensible to watch somebody who's your you love dearly go. Yeah. It's just incomprehensible. Yeah. yeah. But being open and to where he wanted to guide me, opened it up and transformed that experience. My mother died of cancer before, m many years ago, 21 years ago. And we don't, we, I didn't know what I know now, which is exactly what you're describing, is that just being with her. And I think she was in a state of denial, though. And I think that that's, you know, I had to honor that, too. Yeah. No, I remember I had my brother and I, he loved kayaking on lakes and he was coming out of chemo, I think. And we went to a favorite lake of his just to look at the water. And, you know, I was uh, I was all scattered and confused. And he said, you know, well, I've been thinking a lot about, a lot about the big D. And I, and I literally was <laughs> like, like the Dodgers or... <laughs> dad, like, what are you talking about? What is he? And he's like dying. And I was like, what? You know? And, and, uh, I think he, he was much more open to it and it really benefited us all just to be part of this moving into this cycle of life. Did you have life experience that sort of opened that door? Did you talk about it as a family or? Well, I, I think, I think my dad was really important because my dad had done a lot of hospice work and ha has sort of Buddhist leanings. And, you know, as many people know, like the Buddhists are much more open to suffering and dying. And, and I think he had planted some seeds in my brother, my brother's approach to his passing that or death that helped him. And, and my brother, I think it was just his, he just was a, a wise person. You know, mm. he, he knew how like, okay, I feel it in my body. He had his first diagnosis. And this is just how it happens, right? He had 21 nodes affected, lymph nodes. And, and if you have 22, you're in stage four, right. which colon cancers, you're pretty much, that's it. So he's like, okay, they're not calling me stage four, but I'm stage four, you know? And so he knew. Well, I love this question. I'm going to shift a little bit to talk about grief. This is sort of embedded in several questions you ask kind of at the end of the book. It's how do we find awe when someone we love leaves us? How has that experience been for you and your brother, with your brother, after he was gone? I asked that question because the new science suggests, man, awe is so good for your body and mind, as we know. You just get stronger in your heart and your immune system, et cetera. And, uh, you know, watching him go in that chaos, it just knocked me out of everything. And I was kind of zombie-like, except for the work I could do. And really suffering, like a lot of people do in those first stages of grief. And then you know, literally, you know, I'm doing all this research on awe and all the benefits. I felt awe when my brother was passing. And, 
And then I felt aweless. And, and literally I had this, this voice in my mind was like, go find awe. Mm-hmm. And I, I did a couple of things, which is the first is really what you might call an awe mindset, which is like, slow down, be open, have a little part of your day be where you explore a mystery and where you're not goal driven. And I just slowed it down. I explored, I, I went into mysteries. And then the second thing is I used our research as a guide, which is, you know, we have found that you can find awe in eight wonders of life, moral beauty of people, nature, collective movement, music, art, spiritual contemplation, big ideas, life and death. And I literally, I took each of those and the books organized around those eight wonders of life. And in each one, I found big experiences of awe. I tried to find daily experiences of awe. For example, in just thinking about the morally beautiful people in my life whose mm-hmm. sacrifice changed my life. I got out in nature every day and really felt it. I listened to music in a different way. Like, what was the music that changed my life? I thought about big ideas that mattered to me. And, and uh, I had really interesting experiences, you know, where I, I was raised by a visual artist, spent a lot of time as a kid looking at paintings. And just wherever I was, I go to museums and just wander, you know, just look at things. And I found awe again and a new understanding of of life and death. Well, I'd love to read this passage out of your book because it it speaks to me about when someone you love dies, their absence is a presence. Yeah. Um, And I'd like to read this and just see what comes up for you. Okay. But my body tells me in this sense of being touched that he is still somehow nearby that our life together is registered in some permanent electrochemical awareness in the millions of cells in my skin that makes sense of being embraced by my brother, that there is something beyond the corporal body of others' lives that remains in the cells of our bodies when they leave, and that there's so much moral beauty and so much good work to do. On one of my last visits to my brother, he was really heading towards the end He was lying on a couch and he'd given gifts to all of us and told stories about each of us. And he uh, went to the kitchen and I followed him and I, and we were just synced up as brothers. You know, we were just like, we played sports together and walked together to school and just, we were just synced and he and I embraced and uh, I can still feel that embrace. And then he said, we made our way. And that kind of is a theme of our lives, given this crazy childhood and what we ended up doing. And the scene that you, what prompted that reflection was subsequent work in uh, San Quentin, where I hugged a prisoner against the code of being inside, Lewis Scott, who's a friend of mine. and, And it just called forth the sensory experience of hugging my brother. Very often when I hug people, especially men, you know, uh, my brother was this big guy. I feel my brother. And then the reflections there about my brother remaining in my cells and is really what I learned in grieving, which is I'm a, I love science and physiology and brains and neurons and memories and emotions. And, and I have the sense as I grieve the loss of my brother and found my way through awe, made my way again. My, my central insight is that somehow my brother is in my nervous system and he's in my consciousness and he's in how I see things and I can hear him and feel him and, and sense his laugh. And, and that's a miracle of, of the human mind and, and nervous system is people stay with us. I didn't believe that at the start of grief and, and now it feels deeply true. Mm. How long has it been since he left? It's been four years. Four years. Yeah. In addition to your brother's death, are there other experiences that have shaped how you look at death? That feels the most significant one, of course. I I would say the other experience that's interesting, but much more recently is, you know, I've been lucky to do documentary work in Bhutan Mm. recently with National Geographic. And we really oriented the show to dying because they have such a different approach to death. You know, they contemplate it. They have exercises where they think about it. They honor the dead. They plant these prayer poles that remind us of the people who've passed, almost like a day of the dead altar in Mexico. And that 
had an interesting influence on my understanding of death too. Well, in my conversations, I've been looking at all different cultures. Good. And it's remarkable, all of the different rituals and ceremonies around death yeah. and uh, how enlightened that is. Yes, it is. And I know you talk a little bit about impermanence and indigenous wisdom in your book. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about that, about American indigenous wisdom? Well, this really came out of conversations with Dr. Yuria Salidwin, who studies transcendent states and ritual at the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley. Um, and, you know, when you start really engaging deeply with other cultures, you realize like, oh, I have a Western mind that mm -hmm. thinks in terms of linear causality and start and stop times and beginnings and endings, and that's it. And in uh, many indigenous traditions, they have really rich rituals by which they keep people alive, like the Day of the Dead, uh, for your ritual that Salidwin really has written about and informed me of. They have uh, ways of understanding cycles of life, right? And, and that's where I really started to get this idea, also in conversation with Reverend Jennifer Bailey, that there are these cycles that, you know, you go from birth to growth to decay to death to rebirth and regeneration. And I just didn't, you know, I'm a classic Western scientist. I just didn't think like that. Like I thought linearly, not cycles. But in meditating on that in many different ways in writing this book, I realized like cycles of life and death are everywhere. It's the, it's the engine of evolution <laughs> that I study, you know? So, so really Dr. Salidwin and her reflections on her own near death experience, her sort of couching or situating those experiences in the indigenous Nawa Mayan traditions that she grew up in, it just changed everything. You know, mm -hmm. for me, it was like, oh, they're, they're, I just have a narrow understanding of this. There are ideas about cycles that I should think about that really, really meant a lot to me as I, I grieved and learned. Yeah. Well, it's changing everything for me and not only at the level of like ritual and ceremony, but also with the wisdom of forgiveness. And um, I spoke to Dr. Anita Sanchez about forgiving the unforgivable. And I think yeah. one of the things we talk about in A Peaceful Exit is how do we feel lighthearted and peaceful around our relationships, whether those people are still alive or they've passed, you know, because right. some, you have this beautiful, loving relationship with your brother, but some people have complicated relationships. No, I know. And that's part of this broader challenge for us is to take on those harder ones and forgiveness, I agree, is key. And, and you know, I had to reflect on certain ways in which I had been the uptight domineering older brother and, and say, I'm sorry, you know, I was, I was uh, misguided at certain times in my life. So Anita Sanchez shared a powerful story about a near-death experience. What else did you learn about NDEs or near-death experiences in writing this book? I write about Dr. Salidwin's near-death experience in Mexico as a teenager. And for her, her narrative, which is a remarkable narrative, she arrives at a place of transcendent understanding of life and love. Mm -hmm. And when I was contemplating my brother's passing, I, I, as a psychologist, I was like, God, I wonder, I wonder what a state of mind is like. And I think that's what a lot of people who are preparing for the loss wonder. It's like, are they terrified? Are they reflecting on their life? And I, you know, given my orientation, I consulted the scientific literature on near-death experiences. And, and they tend to be, you know, there's a lot of horror and dying and pain, of course. Uh, but, but they are controlling that more and more. But there's a lot of expansive feeling, of mm. oceanic feeling and sensing togetherness and, and the, the purpose of life and love and compassion and awe. Yuria Salidwin's narrative is filled with that and it's poetic and remarkable. And then the scientific literature backs it up. Yeah. Yeah. Like as the, and I saw that in my brother's face, like he really felt like he was leaning into something that he was wanting to be part of. So you're a professor, you're walking around campus, but you see a student and you can see on their face that they're experiencing anxiety or depression. What do you do? I know this personally because, you know, I suffer from a lot. I have a lot of anxiety and found my way through awe. And both my daughters did 
you know, not surprisingly, that's a highly heritable genetically based condition. And so, you know, with students, there's the micro and the macro. And the micro is find moments of awe in your life. And, and I literally have my students, I teach human happiness, 500 people at UC Berkeley, and I give them weekly exercises that have a lot of awe in them. Like, go look at the sky for two minutes and send me a picture. And they do it. And they're like, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, go stand near some water, go find an awe spot on campus where you feel awe. So I give them exercises, share a piece of music with your classmates, which we do, that tells you what you care about in the world, right? Mm. So there are a lot of micro approaches to the everyday awe that I write about that you can go get. Then there's the macro, the big one, right? Which is, and this is interesting because, you know, this generation, the young people today, they're hungering for meaning. Like, what's my purpose? What's yes. my narrative? Yes. And that's well documented. And awe is a pathway to meaning. And so what I do with my students in pretty systematic inquiry is like, let's write about an early experience of awe. And what did it tell you that you really care about right now? And so a student might say, oh, I was awestruck by this volunteer program that was helping orphans. You know, I was awestruck by the cardiovascular system when in ninth grade biology. And that tells them like, oh, I really want to be in social work or mm. a medical doctor. So use awe as paying a, attention. Yeah. Yeah. To what it directs you to. And, and the other thing that I would say is find one deeply awe-inspiring so realm for you and just make it a passion. My daughter, for her, it's rock climbing and it has changed her life, you know, just to climb, find the meditation there, the community, the sense of transcendence. And, and I really urge young people to do that. That's fantastic. One of my passions is dance, and I love the connection mm. between dance and movement and awe and the what you call collective effervescence. Yeah, it is. You know, we're always moving in unison. It, it reaches peak form in dance and clapping at a, a professional sporting event or ritual. And it's such a rich source of, of togetherness and awe. So you write about children today and they're deprived of awe experiences and you have kids yourself. And are there ways as a parent that you facilitate awe for your children? My daughters, Natalie and Serafina, are 25 and 23. So they're kind of, they're on their own and they're working and doing good in the world and, you know, not leaning on me that much. And, and I, the one regret that I have, and, you know, I was part of this performance oriented culture, right? That's so pervasive today that, you know, do well on tests and study hard and focus on your tasks and, and, and you forget to go in search of awe. And I read Rachel Carson's remarkable essay, Teach Your Child to Wonder, which is the antidote, which is go wander with your kids, seek out mysteries where you don't know what's going to happen, mm. which I didn't do much of. I was planning way too much. Don't name everything and label it and categorize it as parents are so want to do. Let, let people experience phenomena. And, and then she has a lot of, you know, very concrete things like, you know, listen, listen to things and see na things in nature and wonder where they come from. Think about their origins. Like look for big patterns out there and it's easy to do. Mm. You just change 30 minutes of your day with your child to be a little bit more mystery, wandering, yeah. exploratory. Yeah. So talk about your epiphany around the default self and systems thinking. It, it was one argument for awe that I, you know, in the scientific literature that I've offered is like, this binds us to collectives and it makes us good group members, right? Cooperative sharing, sacrificing, synchronizing our behaviors with others. And that's essential to life is to be part of groups and collectives. Awe does that. And then I really struggled with what is awe doing for the individual mind in terms of their understanding of the world, because emotions are lenses that teach us how to look at reality in a certain way. Anger is about justice, right? And I was grappling with that. And then when I put the evidence together, I arrived at this epiphany, which is, you know, for so much of our life, we have this narrow focus. We're breaking things down into small parts. It's reductionistic. It's analyzing a conversation in terms of 
the linguistic components and the words and the et cetera. But then we got to broaden out and look at the systems that underlie everything ecosystems and cultural systems and meaning systems and music systems and dance systems. Everything is a system. And that's what awe does, right? You take the micro observation and then broaden out and go, oh my goodness, you know, my brother's death is really part of a long family history of who we are as a people. That flower is suddenly part of this larger system of flora and fauna in this, in this local ecosystem. The cloud I see and marvel at is part of a larger system of clouds etc. You know, the music that I play or that, I, that moved me to awe is part of this long history of humans making music as a system. So, you know, it's a little academic to think about that systems thinking, but it's, you know, a lot of people who study knowledge and the advance of knowledge really feel like it's one of our great achievements is to look at things systemically and imagine the future of things and their interconnectedness. Uh, and that's what awe gives you. How will your book change the conversation? Do you hope this will be part of an education for kids, for for adults? I mean, what's your hope for this book? It's been remarkable, the response in terms of change, right? Because we're at this moment where rising distress, depression, self-harm in kids, alienation, drops in empathy, lack of meaning, wanting more. And, you know, the book... I think has said that awe is around almost every human activity and we should look to ways to cultivate it. So what are we doing for children? We are building an awe course for teachers. Oh, fantastic. That really draws upon what we've been talking about here and says, hey, you know, find a minute or two of awe on your day with with their classrooms and that'll reach tens of thousands of teachers. A lot of interest in medicine and end of life care, very obviously like, oh, this is part of grief and part mm-hmm. of end of life. Of course, here are some things we can do. They're working with it. You know, James Carter at Kaiser Permanente doing really good work on grief groups. I just had anesthesiologists reach out and say like, you know, anesthesiology is awesome. It's like this massive shift in consciousness and you come out of it and your mind is blown. Let's, let's build on awe in that. So I, I think in five to 10 years, You know, we've been through the Zen movement. We've been through the mindfulness movement, still are in it. And I think awe is going to have a smaller, but very present movement for change. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you for your work. I think it's essential and much needed. Thank you for listening to Peaceful Exit. You can learn more about this podcast and my online course at my website, peacefulexit.net. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know. You can rate and review this show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. This episode was produced by Large Media. You can find them at larjmedia.com. Special thanks to Ricardo Russell for the original music throughout this podcast. More of his music can be found on Bandcamp.